Amen. We, we found out that we were not included in that. Amen. Amen. And so uh, I said all that to say this is that it is so good and so timely of what we are studying. And that is evangelism. Because guess what? Although um, Juneteenth is primarily for those who are African-American and uh, Independence Day was primarily, it was, they said we the people, but we wasn't some of the people. Amen. But guess what? Evangelism. Oh, evangelism. You and I can go and share with whomsoever to let them know that who the Son of Man set free, they are free indeed. And so that is what we are studying. That is what we are looking at and have an awesome teacher, preacher uh, to do that. And we just thank him for, uh, for the time he's going to spend with us for the next three weeks uh, teaching us about evangelism. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to move out of the way and bring to us our speaker, and that is Pastor Matthew Davis. Let's encourage him as he comes. Thank you, sir. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, Father God, to come before you. We ask you, Father God, to bless us now. Speak to us. Bless us to hear from you. And bless us to carry out those words that you give us tonight. It's in the precious, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. Amen. Giving honor to God, our Father, to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, to the Holy Spirit, our leader, our teacher, our confidant, and our guide. It's just good to be in one Texas one more game. Amen. Thank God for this privilege. I'm going to push this a little further. Um, Pastor, think I was the size I was back in, back in 2006. <laughs> I'm, I've grown up now. Amen. <laughs> sister there, she and her husband were saying, oh, he's different now. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big boy now. Amen. We're here tonight again for our second night. Thank you, Pastor Stearns and the, and the uh, New Hope Church for inviting us out again tonight. Uh, you had some assignments. Let's begin with that. What was the assignment, somebody? How many of you were here on last week? How many of you were here all right, about 95, 8, 98%. How, how many of you are here for the first time? First time. Amen. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome so much. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Sister, if you would move over just a little bit in the next seat, I can see you and you can see me. Amen. Amen. Sister, that's looking around. The person that you're talking to, they always look around and see who they're talking to. <laughs> Amen. Sister M. Brown came for the first time. Thank you so much. You didn't come for the first time? You raised your hand? You're in church now. <laughs> so what was the homework assignment? What was the homework assignment for last week that would be here for this week? Read chapters 1, 2, and 3. Amen? I'm not going to ask you who read it. I'm not going to ask you, did you read it? I'm not going to ask you, did your dog die so you didn't have time to read it? I'm not going to ask any of that. Amen? I'm going to save Annalise and Sophia tonight, and I'm not going to let them leave here. Amen. So we, are to read, we were to read uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3. Were there other homework assignments? There was a reminder, right? What was the other homework assignment? That's just to pull her notebook out. I like that. Oh, my goodness. She's still faking it. Say again. There, there are assignments at the end of each chapter, right? So as you pass by chapter 1, you were to address that assignment or those assignments. You pass by chapter 2, you were to address those assignments. And when you pass by chapter 3, you were to address those assignments. I, I, I don't want to hear that God knows my heart. God knows my heart. I got so busy. God, God knows my heart. But I'm not going to even challenge you in that tonight. Did anybody read the five P's to effective evangelism? How many P's? Five. Five P's. Now, when you recite them or when you tell us what they are, you got to tell them in order, okay? Because the order means something. Who wants to stand in real big and tell us what are the five P's to effective evangelism? What are the five P's? Yes. 
She said she gonna get hers on out the way now. Prepare, pinpoint, personalize, picturize, and prescribe. Did you remember that from 2006, or, or you got that 2023? 20, 20, <laughs> I see. Amen. So there are five P's to effective evangelism. They are. Let's start over. We we all together. If one person flunk, everybody flunk. Amen. Five P's to effective evangelism. Amen. Everybody get an A on that part for tonight. Who know who Melissa is, honey? Will you bring the baby up here? And have a seat. Bring the baby right here. Her special. Who know who that who knows who that is? That's Melissa. Who wants to stand up and tell us who Melissa is? And tell us something about Melissa. Just two or three things about Melissa. Anybody? Anybody? Melissa has a heart problem. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. She has a heart condition, just like all of us have. Anybody else? Anybody else knows who Melissa is? Who does Melissa belong to? Yeah. Amen. Why is that important to note? You care, about you care about your child. Every person care about their child, right? How many people that, no, I better not ask that. Somebody may want to raise their hand and say, I want to get rid of mine. Don't, I won't ask that in this meeting. <laughs> last, week, last week I was coming up the stairway with a briefcase, and I had Melissa sitting on the briefcase, and I was, I was coming up King's Highway, boom, boom, boom. I was pull it, pulling her up the stairway, and the sister said, oh, look how you're treating that baby. <laughs> the good thing about it is, is that you got people in your church who love children, amen? The other good thing about it, she didn't call them folk on me and put them folk in my business, amen? <laughs> so God is good. There are five Ps to effective evangelism, and they are... Amen. And so Melissa has a heart problem. She looks good. Big old pretty eyes, nice decorated lips, big rosy cheeks. Melissa looks good. Look like Melissa has no problems. Melissa is awesome. Look good as a baby. She's even well dressed now. I carry Melissa around since 1998 with the same dress on. My wife said, we're going to the New Hope Church, and she will not have the same dress on. <laughs> Brand new dress. <laughs> and now she got what y'all call it? I call it a bow rack. Y'all said I was wrong last week. Headband, okay. She has a brand new headband. Amen? So this is not, this is not the same dress code that Melissa had when Pastor Stern came through, through the class. So Melissa has a, me, a major problem. She has a heart problem. Matter of fact, her heart is such a bad uh, problem for her until she doesn't need heart surgery. She needs a open heart transplant. She has a problem. I told you on last week when your child has a, has a problem, you do whatever it takes to get your child to the doctor. Some of y'all cuss folk out to get them to the, get your child in the doctor. How many of you heard of uh, John Q? John Q. John Q. Tell us, sister, who is John Q? John Q. John Q. Had a gun. He shut the whole hospital down and told doctors, "You're not going anywhere until my son get this heart condition fixed." And we're not going to do it next week, and we're not waiting until I get insurance. Some of us will even go to desperate measures for our children. When it comes to soul winning, we have to go through desperate measures to win souls. We must do some things out of the ordinary to win souls. I did much of my evangelism training and my evangelism demonstrations in Third Ward, I mean Third Ward, Houston, Texas. Are you with me? 
And when I did my evangelism training, you would go to a corner and there were drug dealers and prostitutes on the corner. And one day we, we went down, we unloaded the van. It was about 40 of us. We got off and we're going to witness to the people that's hanging out on the corner. And the drug, drove, uh, the drug dealer drove by and he said, this is my corner. Get off my corner. So as the leader, I said, okay, everybody on the van, all the women on the van, every woman and every child, get back on the van. Took all the women and the children on the van, said, you all stay here and pray. I got every man and every boy that I could find and took them right back to the corner. The same corner that he said that was his corner. I realized that the earth is the Lord and the, truth, <laughs> and the fullness thereof. Even they that dwell in it. Even the guy that told us to leave the corner. I got every boy that I could find, saved or unsaved. Every man I could find. A guy was out there weed eating. Another guy was shutting the grass. I said, shut it down right now. We going to the corner. We went back to the corner, the same corner, the same drug dealer was still sitting there, and I said to him, we back on the corner. Within 20 minutes, we had them, all of them that was on the corner, in a circle holding hand, and we leading them in prayer because you got to do some desperate things in order to win souls. Sometimes you just got to do some desperate things. Sometimes you have to do some things that, that are kamikaze things. Sometimes you got to do some things that other folk won't do because you are a soul winner and you are there to win souls. You are there to go to, through great lengths to reach somebody for Jesus Christ. You thought when you got saved, you just got saved so you can make it to heaven. Oh, some people have gotten saved and they just going to heaven anyhow and, and they, they don't care about anybody else going. And we as saved believers treat ourselves and treat other people just like we do on Sunday morning. We do it all during the week. How many of you have a car that holds more than two persons? Hold more than two persons in your car. How many of y'all rode here on a motorcycle? Hmm. So your car holds more than one person. Why is it on Sunday morning only one person is in your car? If we're about winning souls, if we're about reaching souls for Christ, we got to pack our cars with people that don't even like us. We got to, if we can't get them to Christ right then and there, just maybe God got some at the church that will get them through and get through the them. When you look at the psalmist in Psalm 73, he says, Ugh, my feet was almost gone and my steps had well nigh slipped. And I thought I needed to be like those who were making it. They were leaning. Somebody heard the song, digging the scene with the gangster lean, gangster white wall. Ooh, ooh. You, you, I know y'all hadn't been Christian all your days. I looked at the sinful and I was envious of them. And I thought I wanted to be like them. But I did not realize it until I went to the sanctuary of God. And then I saw their end was one of destruction. And only the righteous and what you do for Christ will last. I remember one, one Sunday, I, I was on my way to church, going on my way to Sunday school, and and I, I was dressed to the hilt. I was casket ready. I was dressed up. I was sure enough dressed up. I stopped by the gas station. The brother came up to me. And one thing about me, I got you before you get me. Brother walked up, and I knew he was about to ask me for some money. I, I let the gas pump go, ran over to him, and said, hey, man, can you loan me $10? And, man, let me tell you, that dude got fighting mad. Man, you know I was going to ask you for some money. Why are you going to ask me for some? You knew that's why I was coming to you. I said, brother, can you go to church with me? He said this. He said, well, I can't go to church with you because I can't dress like you. He said to me, I don't have the clothes that you have on. So what I did, I took my tie off. And I gave it to him. And I went to church with no tie. 
And I thought I had done something. I got this brother to come to church. He, he, he's no longer begging on the street. I got him to come to church. I walked up in the church. I was proud. One of the traditional deacons stopped me. He said, you call yourself a preacher? And you don't even have a town? I said, well, well, Deke, this is what happened. Deke, I told him the story. I said, this guy said he would come to church with me if I would dress down and dress him up. Look at him. He got my towel. He said, well, if you're the kind of guy that give away your tie, you ought to ride in your truck with a bunch of ties so you can give away one and you can dress up with one. One of us missed it. Either he missed it or I missed it. One of us flat missed it. I mean, one of us missed it. I, I told you last week, I said, you need to make sure those people who are hard on their luck, those who are stuck in sin, that you consider them your child, and you got to go get them and drag them in here, plead with them to come in here, pay them to show up, buy them breakfast to show up. Whatever it takes, you need to make sure you present Jesus Christ to them. Because you're saved to reach others. You are saved to make a difference. And yeah, we're going to heaven. And see, going to heaven is easy. I'm telling you it's easy. We have made it hard. But going to heaven is so easy. Matter of fact, we thought that we couldn't be Christians because we didn't want to quit what we were doing. Let me just serve you notice. You can't quit what you're doing anyhow. There is nothing you can do about what your sin nature has been telling you to do for years. You didn't get in that condition overnight, so you're not going to get out of that condition overnight unless God said so. So you can't get out of the condition until God said so. So I tell people all the time, don't wait to come to Christ until you stop doing things to come to Christ. You need to come to Christ and let Christ clean you up. What I, what, I was trying to, what I was trying to tell that deacon, Pastor Stern, what I was trying to tell that deacon is, we got to catch them before we clean them. We can't clean them, then catch them. We got to catch them before we clean them. So we, we have a cycling ministry. Cycling, bicycling, bicycling ministry. And everything we do, we are out to get souls for Jesus. We are a cycling ministry, so we ride bikes. And every time we stop at a place, we are looking for God to send somebody that needs Jesus. We were riding one day, and there was a homeless woman standing out begging. And you know, some people are generous, and some of them are not. I myself, I really don't give away money. I give away food. <laughs> and so we stop, and uh, I, I think I gave the woman a, a breakfast bar or something, but there's one brother that reached in his pocket and gave her $20. And so between the breakfast bar and $20, we ended up leading her to Christ. You got to catch them before you clean them. we never seen that woman again. But one thing we gave her was Jesus Christ. And, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about being prepared and pinpoint. Um, there are some assignments that you need to know about. Write these down in your margin somewhere. Uh, first thing we need to do is pair up. We need you to find a friend, a buddy for this class. If you like your husband, he can be your husband. He can be your friend. If you got questions about the guy, don't tell him. But you need another person you can pair up with. Are you with me? If, how many people are not from, from New Hope? Not from, who, who's the guest? One, one, not from New Hope. Someone has to pair up with that brother. Is he the only one that's not from New Hope? So his guest, his, the person that invited him, going to pair up with him, correct? Who invited Okay, so we're going to pair up. We're going to be a team to the end of this session. Pastor Stern has already told you that we have to demonstrate what we learn, right? So what we're going to do is that we're going to have role reversal. One person going to be the witness and the other one going to be the patient, and then you're going to reverse roles and you're going to be the patient and that person going to be a witness, okay? 
So everybody has somebody already? Everybody has somebody? Sister Stern looking at Pastor Stern. I guess she likes him today. <laughs> everybody has a friend. Everybody has a buddy. Everybody has somebody they can pair up with. Everybody has somebody? Everybody has somebody. Okay, raise your hand if you don't have somebody. You need somebody you can pair up with. You need somebody that you can be with. Okay, you have one. Uh, she has, has one over here. Okay, the lady with the, with, with the motorcycle rag on going to come join you over here. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> the cyclist going to come join you over here. Amen. Hallelujah. See, we invite cyclists to church, don't we? So you need somebody that you can pair with for the whole time of this class. And let me tell you our secret. Let me, let me tell you a secret. I haven't even gotten it approved from Pastor Stern yet, but I'm going to do this. If you do real well doing this four-week course, I'm going to give you one week off. If you, if you do real good, if you do real good, if you participate, Doing this four-week course, I'm going to make it four weeks instead of five. I'm going to give you one week off. But you, you got to do good. Now, can you pick your week? Oh, no, I got to pick the week. So you need a partner. You need to pair off. You're going to have role reversal. The next thing is write down page 134. Page 134. There are scenarios there. Some people call them scenarios. There are scenarios there, page 134. On page 139, there are assignments there. 139, there are assignments. Assignments on page 139. And finally, write down page 25, page 25, there are four spiritual laws there, and one of the things I'm going to give you tonight are the Roman roads. Okay, so page 25 is a four spirit law. You have a book, brother? You have a book? Do you have a book? No? Yes? Okay. So everybody have a book? Does everybody have a book? Okay. Page 25 are the four spiritual laws, and we're going to add on that page, we're going to add the Roman road. Page 134 are scenarios. Page 139 are all the assignments that's in all the chapters. And then the other thing is we're going to pair off. Everybody should have somebody by now. Does everybody have somebody? Okay. So look at page number 25. Everybody doesn't have somebody? Everybody does have somebody? Everybody going to have some, going to have somebody. Okay, let's go to page 120, I mean page 25. On page 25, there is what is known as the four spiritual laws. Page 25. The four spiritual laws. The four spiritual laws. These were written by Mr. Bright. They're called the four spiritual laws. Law number one, God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. John 3.16. Number two, man is sinful and separated from God. Romans 3 and 23. Law three, God demonstrates his love by Jesus' death and resurrection of, for our sins. Romans 8 and 12 and 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. Jesus is the only one who can connect us to God. Law number four, you must receive Jesus for yourself by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. John 1, 12 and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. This is in the middle of the scenario I gave you last week. I hope when you got home you didn't call your neighbor or tweet your neighbor or email your neighbor and say, that's one nasty preacher leading folks to Christ in the restroom. 
I was in the middle of one of these sessions, and I talked about leading a man to Christ in the restroom. One of the ladies raised her hand and said, my pastor told me that there's a time and a place for everything. My pastor told me it's a time and place for everything. Now, was that the right time to be leading somebody to Christ? I said to her, sister, I respect your pastor, and he's right. But the fact of the matter is we gossip in the restroom. We sin in the restroom. <laughs> we backbite in the restroom. We can't talk about Jesus in the restroom. And there was a hush. Okay, let me give you the, the, um, the Romans Road. The title is The Roman Road. The Romans Road. Number one, Romans 3 and 23. Romans 3 and 23. And these may differ depending on who's giving them to you. Number two, Romans 6 and 23. Romans 6 and 23. Number three, Romans 5 and 8. Romans 5 and 8. Number four, four, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Romans 10, 9, and 10. And number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Romans 10 and 13. Romans 10 and 13. Why do they call it the Romans Road? Is on the Romans road. They all deal with Romans, right? So these are the two different formats that we're going to use to lead people to Christ. Very simple, very, very straightforward. And when you look at them, I want you to write them down and explain what the Roman road really is. Amen. I'm on page 35. It is prepare. We went over some of prepare last week. We talked about the fact that the soul winner must be prepared to refer the patient to the great physician for healing. The great physician is Jesus Christ. We must be prepared. In preparation, the soul winner is an intern. And the soul winner tells the patient what the doctor can do. He tells the patient what the doctor will do. He tells the patient what the doctor will do for him, what the doctor will do through him, and what the doctor will do to him. Are you with me? Remember, in prepare, we have to be prepared to win souls. If we're not prepared, then we cannot be a part of the greatest miracle on planet Earth. The greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the winning of a lost soul. It's good that you've been saved from cancer. You've been cured. It's good that HIV is no longer in your life. That's a miracle. It's good that the doctor performed surgery and it went well. But the greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. It is the greatest miracle that one will ever experience. And when we uh, witness a saving of a lost soul, we ought to rejoice. When you look at Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son comes home, the daddy throws a party. He shut down the whole city, not for Mardi Gras, but for the saving of a lost soul. He shut down the whole city, not for a, a championship, but for the saving of a lost soul. This boy was dead, and now he's alive. This boy was lost, and now he's found. He even went to the extent to say, look at my boy looking raggedy. Go in and put a robe on his shoulder. Go and put shoes on his feet. Go and put a ring on his hand, and whatever you do, that, that, that calf that we had out there on the fattening flow, go and bring the fattest calf, and we're going to make merry and music start playing. When folk come down the aisle at church, when folk give their lives to Christ, you ought to tear the roof off the house. You ought to, you ought to be rejoicing because one more soul has come. To Jesus Christ. 
the soul winner must already be saved. You can't save anybody else or you can't lead anybody else to Christ unless you are born again. Now, being born again is not running, jumping, shouting, rolling on the floor, speaking in other tongues. These things you may do that's left up to you and the Holy Ghost. But what you must do, Dorothy Steele, y'all know who Dorothy Steele is? Dorothy Steele said that you must repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. That he died for your sins. That he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And that he rose from the dead. And he was seen by over 500 men at one time. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom. This word see, this word see means you cannot perceive it. You can't even understand it. The apostle Paul said, no sense in you even getting on the nerves of an unsaved man. No need of you even, uh, you even talking him down. There's no need of you even believing that he understands the spirit of God because these things are spiritually discerned and the unsaved man, the natural man, cannot discern those spiritual things. Are you with me? So we need to make sure that we understand we must be born again. We must be saved. And I will say this, as I've said in many other sessions, you need to know that you are born again. And if you are born again, and you say you're born again, and you think you're born again, if you're not born again by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are not born again. Regardless of what Ophir says, there are no other ways other than the only begotten Son of God. His name is Jesus. There's no going under him. There's no going over him. There's no going around him. There's no going about him. It is name is Jesus. He's the only one who saves us. I know you wouldn't be coming out here, coming out here at night uh, in the evening time to hear the man of God talk about the word and explain the word if you wasn't saved. And now that you're saved, you got to go and reach folk for Jesus Christ. Salvation only comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. I'm at the top of page 37. When you look at page 37, Jesus is God's son. This is the middle of a prayer. Let's go back to page 36. This is a prayer. And what I've done is I've broken down Dorothy Steele's testimony to me in Ms. John, Ms. Bonner's sixth period class on May 6, 1980, in Ms. Bonner's sixth period class, right around 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon, Dorothy Steele turned around, looked at me, and said, you don't have to live like you're living. You can be changed right here, right now, in this room. She said that birds don't have to fly, birds doesn't have to sing, the sky doesn't have to open, the earth doesn't have to quake, but what you must do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. I bowed my head in Ms. Bonner's sixth Sixteenth period class, room number two, across the hall from the cafeteria in Gentry High School in Indianola, Mississippi, and invited Christ into my life that day. So Jesus is the Son of God. We must believe that he died for our sins. Page number 37. We must believe that he was buried in a borrowed tomb. We must believe on the third day he rose from the dead. And then we must believe that we have to invite Jesus into our lives. Make us new. Fill us with this Holy Spirit. And this part right here where it says fill you with the Holy Spirit, you need to understand one thing really well. You don't have to go to another Colosseum to be filled to, with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to have a person blow on you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to have another slap you side your head and you fall to the ground to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ comes in our lives, the Holy Spirit comes also. Because we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit three in one. 
he is here. When I was at the Homer Street Church in Third Ward, the service would get really hot in there. I mean, I mean, people shouting and praising the Lord all over the place. One girl would walk down the aisle. Diane Page would walk down the aisle. Teresa Diane Page would walk down the aisle. She would, she would be shouting and shaking. She said, he's here. He's here. He's here. He's here. She would announce to the whole church, he's here. He's here. What she's saying is, I feel his presence. I see his presence. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the, he is here. Let me tell you, when he comes in, when Jesus comes in, the Holy Spirit comes in. You don't have to give away any more money. You don't need any more prayer clothes. I tell the people at the New Beginning Church, if you take my handkerchief or my towel that I use on Sunday, you got a lot of snot and a lot of sweat, and that's all you got. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you can give me some money if you want it, and you ought to give the man of God some money every now and then. You ought to give the man of God a blessing every now and then. You ought to give the man of God some encouragement every now and then. But if you give it to me for some a paper towel or for a handkerchief or a towel, you got two things and you got a whole lot of it. Some snot and you have some sweat. Has nothing to do with my blessings. And it certainly doesn't have anything to do with yours. You see, we have to make sure that we focus on Jesus. We have to be, you ought to serve your pastor. You ought to give him money. He has a family. He has a wife. You can't look that good without money. Now, amen, go right there and y'all missed it. You, you, he, he has, he has the dress. He, <laughs> he has to ride. And when he pulls up the Exxon, they don't say, oh, there's old Reverend, he's free today. <laughs> so, so we have to understand, we have to keep the main thing the main thing. Keep, we have to prioritize Jesus. And when we prioritize Jesus, let me tell you something. God has you. Let me say like I said in the hood, God got you. I, I, I did a demonstration on last Sunday, Sunday before this past Sunday, on tithing. And we, I had 10, 7, whatever. God get 1, I get 6. God get 1, I get 9. And my cup just running over. Because when we give to God, God blesses us over and abundantly. But he doesn't only bless us with money. He blessed us with good health. He blessed us with good attitudes. He blessed bless us with a sane mind. Let me tell you a secret. If God does not keep your mind, your mind can't be kept. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how smart you are. I mean, this week alone, I walked downstairs twice and forgot why I went downstairs. I mean, twice already. And guess what? This is Tuesday. Sunday, Monday, I walked downstairs twice. And, and I'm only 60. If God doesn't keep your mind, it can't be kept. Don't let the devil fool you like you smart because you educated. Don't, don't let the Lord fool you. Don't let the devil fool you, rather. Don't let the devil. If the Lord doesn't keep it, I don't care how good looking you are. I don't care how you built. I don't care how you go to the gym. You can look like a brick house. That's an old term, y'all. Some, some of y'all know. You can look like a brick house and be confused in your mind. I mean, your, your mind could be gone. That's why the senior saints would say he gave me a, a partial, uh, just a, a, a bit of my health and strength. One thing I appreciate about, appreciate about, about the, the New Hope Church is that you all know how to call on God. Pastor Stern, they know how to call on God in this church. They know how to pray, and they're not ashamed of praying. 
And they don't, they don't have these long spurts where you got to beg and pump and prime somebody to pray. The two most neglected disciplines in church are prayer and evangelism. Prayer and evangelism. We need to get folk caught up on Jesus, and I'm on page number 38. Jesus must be the main attraction. Jesus must be the main attraction. I got my clock tonight. Y'all ain't going to fool me tonight. You may fool Pastor Stearns on Sunday, but you ain't going to fool me tonight. Jesus must be the main attraction. Jesus must be the main attraction. Now, let me tell you, right, in your, uh, right above main attraction, write these words, center of attention. Jesus must be the main attraction, and Jesus must be the center of attention. I was in a church for, for, um, for Resurrection Sunday. I was visiting the church for Resurrection Sunday one time. And church had gone on. It was time for the preacher. up. You know when it's time for the preacher to get up? A lot of church has taken place by then, right? This sister walked in on, on Resurrection Sunday with her canary hat on, her canary shoes, and her long flowing dress on. And she walked right down the center aisle, and the pastor just stopped and said, Girl, come on down here with your canary green, canary yellow on. She became the center of attention, and she thought she was the main attraction. But I stopped by to tell you on my way to the rapture, there's only one who can be the main attraction. (laughs) You may try to put the attention on you, but Jesus has to be the center of attention, and Jesus has to be the main attraction in order for you to be a legitimate soul winner. I told you last week, I'm still on page 38, that 90% of your soul winning experience is dealt with in preparation. 90% of your soul winning experience must be in your preparation. Preparation such as Bible study, prayer, and meditation. You can tell when a preacher, a teacher, a soul winner has spent time with the Lord. You can tell. In, in, Acts, in Acts, they were watching Peter, James, and John, and things were happening and miracles were taking place. They said, we know these are unlearned men. These men has not been, have not been to seminary. They are unlearned men. They have not studied the Torah. They're unlearned men. These men are unlearned men. But one thing we know, they have been with the Lord. When you spend time with God, it'll show up in your lifestyle. And and I'm not not, not talking about shouting, running, jumping, saying amen, because we know when to say amen. I mean, we we know when to say hallelujah. We know when to do it. We know how to do it. We know when to, you know, one thing, Pastor Stern, that I've come to the conclusion. People can hear the same song every Sunday. And they can shout off the same song at the same spot in the song every Sunday. But you try preaching the same text two Sundays in a row. Matter of fact, if you if you covering a book, if you cover in a book of the Bible, they get tired of that by midways. Sister told me, sister told me, we've been on the book of Romans for a whole year and a half. I said, you telling me now you don't have it yet either. Because if it's boring you, you don't, you're not getting it. You try, and then, you know, when in Bible study, I kind of do my review like I've done with you here tonight. Folks said, Oh, you spent half of the Bible studying, repeating what you said last week. Well, when I asked questions, you didn't get it last week, and I know you didn't get it this week because you hadn't spent any time with the Lord last week. I'm sorry, y'all. I, I, got, I get caught up sometime. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
So only 10%, only 10% of your soul winning time ought to be spent actually sharing the gospel. Because if you don't spend 90% of your time studying, meditating, and, and pray, praying, guess what? You don't know anything to say. And you can't use the same canned goods you've been using all these years. When, when, you, when you hear preachers talk about canned goods, that means that's the same old soup, never been warm. It means he preaches, you know, you know, I always wondered, how can preachers take 66 books and preach from the same 66 books for 50 and 70 years? But I, I know the God that we serve, he revealed to us what we need to hear in 2000 and what we need to hear in 2023 from the same book. So don't get mad at your pastor if he talks about the same text. He's going to be talking about a different thing. So you ought to spend 10% of your soul winning experience just sharing the gospel, actually sharing the gospel. Because it's not on us for people to come to Christ through us, it takes the Holy Spirit to draw one. The Holy Spirit has to draw us. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, He. Did I mess somebody up? The God Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, He. He is an intelligent being. Don't consider your children a it. Your children are he or she. And I know they put them on the line now, but we can't cover that tonight. It's either a he or it's a she. The Holy Spirit is a he, not a it. And I told you last week, the Holy Spirit doesn't hit you. And he doesn't make you do stuff. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And he speaks to us. He's intelligent. He reveals to us. He reminds us what the word of God said. The Holy Spirit, he. So the Holy Spirit is the one who draws us. Only the gospel of Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection will turn hearts toward God. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we talked about last week, the gospel is good news and the good news is of jesus christ and there are four pillars to that gospel to that good news jesus died jesus buried jesus rose and jesus was seen first corinthians chapter 15 when you are a serious soul winner number one you will journal and keep records of your devotional time at our church, we're listening through the Bible for the whole year. We're listening through the Bible. And it could, turns out to be like four chapters a day. Some places, six chapters a day. And I said to the people, if you don't have time for God, you too busy. So we're listening through the Bible. And as we listen through the Bible, they are to be journaling. Re writing down their devotional time, their thoughts, their ideas, what the Holy Spirit is bringing to their remembrance. Meditating on the word daily through Bible study. Prayer, praying daily and watching the Holy Spirit minister to you. Making sure that the Holy Spirit is ministering to you. You ought to pray the word and pray over the word. You pray the word. Lord, you said in your word. Make sure it's, it, it's attached to you now. Make sure the promise that you're telling God about, make sure God is making that promise to you. God, you said in your word that you will make me the head and not the tail. God, you said in your word that the righteous will never be forsaken and the seed of the righteous will never be begging bread. And let me tell you, we got children these days that got off a different truck. So you have to pray for them. And you have to pray distinctively the word of God. Tell God what God has said. So you have to pray the word. God, your word says. God, your word promises. My daughter was on life support three, three weeks ago. And I was in that room reminding God of what his word said. I mean, life support. 
They called me, and they didn't know what hospital she was going to. They didn't, they didn't know what condition she was in. They just knew she was on life support. And then when I get to the hospital, they don't know where she is. And then they tell me there's no Megan Davis here. And then somebody somewhere dropped her name, and her name was Swiskey 3 in the hospital. Jane Doe, Whiskey 3. Let me tell you, it's time to pray God's word. Don't just, just, don't just call out words. Remind God what God has said. So you pray God's word. And the second thing you do in prayer, you pray over God's word. As you study in the word, as you meditate on the word, you, you say, God, reveal to me what your word is saying. God, show me what your word is saying. God bless me by, to know what your word is saying because your word is valuable to me. Stop tweeting. Stop facing. Stop emailing and talk to God about it. Every time I was up for a promotion, they sent a supervisor down. Every single time they sent a supervisor down and said, you know, this one particular time he said, you know, this job is for, for Scott Steins. This description for this job got everything about Scott Steins on it except his hair color. And my statement was, let's see what God says about it. Christians are too afraid to invoke God in their trouble. If they invoke the devil, you invite God. So we have to make sure that we make sure that the Holy Spirit blesses us and walks with us. Then the circumstances and our challenges of life will cause us to be consistent in prayer. The circumstances in life. Let me tell you, if you got a consistent prayer life, you don't have to go cross town and get God when you get in trouble. <laughs> if you have a consistent prayer life, you don't have to say, God, come in the building. He's already here. But when we say, and I understand real well, when the senior saints say, come in the building, if you don't stay too long, what they were really saying is manifest yourself right here before the people. Because God promised that he will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. I told you last week, he sets a banquet in the presence of your enemies while they're watching you. The best solution is not to fight. And I know for your folk, it's hard not to fight. Because all of us got some fighting folk in our family. My, my mama's background is Choctaw Indian. Yeah, did you hear what I said? Choctaw Indian. We can go to zero to 500 over a second. I mean, the whole conversation can, if it had not been for the Lord, I'd be dead right now. If it had not been for the Lord, I would have killed somebody by now. Because I got Choctaw Indian in me. My daughter got the hair. I got the attitude. So we have to understand, we got to make sure, we have to make sure that we understand really well that we have to participate in prayer on a regular basis. Decide on a regular place, decide on a regular time, be faithful to God because God is faithful to you, meditate on his word. Have a devotional period. Pray over the word, pray the word. I'm on page 39, I'm going to have to quit because I don't want to go over my time. And guess what, because I won't be able to get my time back next week. The cardiovascular specialists, they study several years to be able to, to do surgery. In every surgery he or she performs, they get better and better and better at it. For the soul winner, the more we share Jesus Christ, we get better and better and better at it. Don't worry about rejection. They are not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. So the preparation stage is the single most important aspect of the soul winning process. Be prepared. I got to tell you a story, and then I'll leave you alone. It's called the, the bilingual witness. I was coming out of the chemical plant, had spent my 12 hours, and I was... I had a meeting afterwards for about two more hours, so I've been gone from home by 16 to 17 hours. So I'm coming down 225, and I'm weaving in and out of traffic like I do, you know. 
I'm weaving in and out of traffic, and I look to my left, and there's a lady standing outside of the car with the hood up. And there was a baby on the back seat standing up where I could see her, and it's 91 degrees outside, so we can imagine how hot it is on the inside of the car. So I, I hit the next exit, made a U-turn, come around, and then when I pulled up, there's a man with his head under the hood. If I had known there was a man there, I would have kept on south. But there's a man there, so now I'm here, I got to make sure that I do what's right. We tried to get the car started. We couldn't get it started, so they had to go to Baytown and come back, and the Baytown tunnel is where we hit. We hit the Baytown tunnel. We talked. I was talking to his wife because she spoke English and Spanish. He didn't speak anything but Spanish. I'm talking to him, and, you know, out of respect for the man, I tell her, you tell him what I just said. I don't want no problems now. <laughs> So we, we on our way back from Baytown, we hit the tunnel, and when we went into the tunnel, the man was unsaved. The lady was saved, but the man was not saved. I said, tell him that God offers a wonderful plan for his life. She said, I'm ready to look at you. And I said, tell him that he must repentantly receive him for himself. She spoke it in Spanish. And then I told him, he can tell him that, that he can invite Jesus Christ into his life right now. I'm still driving. I'm talking to her, and she's talking to him. He's talking to her, and she's talking about to me. And I said, bow his head right now and invite Jesus Christ into his life based on the fact that Jesus died for your sin. He was buried in a bar tomb. He rose from the dead and he invited Jesus. When he went into the tongue, he was unsaved, but when he came out of the tongue, he was saved. Now that's speaking in tongues. Amen. Can we give Pastor Matthew Davis another hand? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Prepare. Preparation is what we must uh, prioritize. We must put that at the top. Uh, we must prepare. In order to go out, you got to be prepared. Uh, you got to be prepared. And so um, hopefully and prayerfully, Pastor uh, Davis, any homework? So last week you had, last week you had chapters 1, 2, and 3. This week you have chapters 3, 4, and 5. Last week you had 1, 2, and 3. This week you have 3, 4, and 5. So make sure you make that mental note. Uh, chapters 3, 4, and 5 will be our homework assignment. Uh, any uh, prayer requests or praise reports before we give our closing prayer? Yes. 